quantum mechanics, where even the simplest problems reveal deep insights about the nature of reality. Today, we're diving into problem 2.6 from Griffiths, a deceptively simple exercise that will test our understanding of probability and wave functions. Let's break it down step by step and see what physics has to say. Last time, we explored problem 2.5 and saw how a superposition of energy eigenstates evolves over time. But now, we're adding a new twist. What happens when we introduce a phase shift between the two states? This phase factor, phi, may seem like a small change, but it has real physical consequences. It affects the probability distribution and even the expectation value of position. In other words, quantum interference isn't just about which states we combine, it's also about how we combine them. We'll go through the math step by step, but before that, let's take a look at a visualization of what's actually happening. Let's start by breaking it down. In this animation, you can see the individual components of the wave function. On the top left, we have psi 1 of x and t, and on the top right, we have e to the i phi times psi 2 of x and t. Notice that phi controls the relative phase of these two components. Next, when we superimpose these two states, the overall wave function, psi of x and t, is shown here on the bottom left. The interference between psi 1 and e to the i phi times psi 2 is what gives rise to the rich structure you see. Changing phi affects the relative phase, which shifts the interference pattern. Finally, on the bottom right, we have the square modulus of psi, representing the probability density, a quantity directly measurable in quantum mechanics. I've also plotted the expectation value of x on this graph. As we start changing phi, you'll see how both the interference pattern and the expectation value of position begin to shift dynamically. Here's the fun part. Let's vary phi from zero to two pi while keeping time at zero. Notice how the probability density changes. At certain values of phi, the interference is constructive, enhancing certain regions of the probability density, while at others, it's destructive. This dynamic is a direct result of the relative phase between psi one and psi two. Now let's fix phi at pi over two and let time evolve. With this phase, the interference pattern is asymmetric and the expectation value starts to oscillate. This is because the time evolution introduces a phase difference proportional to the energy difference, E2 minus E1, which drives the oscillations in the probability density. To recap, we've seen how introducing a relative phase phi between the two stationary states can influence the interference pattern and the expectation value of position. Next, we'll dive deeper by finding the time-dependent wave function, psi of x and t, the probability density, and the expectation value of position. This will give us a clearer understanding of how phi affects the system's evolution and measurable properties. Now that we've seen the impact of the phase shift visually, let's break it down mathematically. We start with the general equation for a particle in an infinite square well, where the potential is defined as follows. Since we're dealing with stationary states, we can separate the time-dependent part, leaving us with the spatial wave function for the nth state. For our problem, we're specifically interested in the first two states. So let's write those out. The initial wave function at time t equals zero is a superposition of these two states, but with a phase shift applied to psi two of x. Now we substitute these explicit forms into our equation to express psi x and zero entirely in terms of sine functions. Here, small a represents the width of the well, while capital A is the normalization constant. Now that we have our initial wave function expressed in terms of psi one and psi two, the next step is to determine the value of capital A. To do that, we use the normalization condition. The total probability of finding the particle anywhere in space must be one. This means the integral of the probability density over all space must equal one. 
Since probability density is given by the wave function multiplied by its complex conjugate, we rewrite this in a more useful form. This will allow us to substitute our initial wave function and solve for a. Now, let's apply the complex conjugate to our initial wave function. The only effect this has is changing the sign of i in the phase shift term. Everything else remains the same. With this in place, we're ready to expand the expression and evaluate the integral. Now let's take a closer look at this term, e to the i phi plus e to the negative i phi. This is a well-known identity from Euler's formula, which tells us that the sum of these two exponentials is simply two times cosine of phi. At this point, our normalization equation simplifies to a sum of three separate integrals. Each term inside the brackets corresponds to a distinct integral that we need to evaluate. Let's start by evaluating the first integral, the integral from zero to a of sine squared of pi x over a. Using the standard identity for sine squared, we rewrite it as one half times one minus cosine of two pi x over a. Now, integrating term by term, the integral of one gives a, and the integral of cosine gives zero over the limits, leaving us with a over two as the final result. We now substitute this result back into our normalization equation. Looking at the last integral, we notice that it follows the exact same steps as the first one. So without repeating the full derivation, we can immediately conclude that its result is also a over two. Now replacing this value in our equation, we have successfully computed the first and third integrals. Next, we move on to the middle term. To simplify this integral, we use a standard identity for the product of two sine functions, rewriting it in terms of cosines. Now, when we integrate these cosine terms from zero to a, we find that both terms vanish. This means the entire middle term contributes nothing to our equation. With the middle term gone, we are left with just the sum of the first and last terms, each of which we found to be a over two. Solving for capital A, we find that capital A, the normalization constant, is simply one over the square root of two. Now that we've determined the normalization constant, we substitute it back into our initial wave function. Now let's recall the general form of a wave function in an infinite square well. By comparing our specific wave function to this general form, we can identify the coefficients b sub n. We find that for n greater than or equal to three, b sub n is simply zero. So our wave function is only made up of the first two states, confirming that higher energy levels do not contribute. Now, let's move from the initial wave function to its time-dependent form. The general solution is given by this summation. Here, b sub n represents the expansion coefficients. Psi sub n of x are the stationary states, or eigenfunctions, of the infinite potential well, and the exponential term describes the time evolution of each energy eigenstate. To make our calculations cleaner, let's define a constant omega, which represents pi squared times h bar over 2m a squared. Let's substitute the values of b sub 1 and b sub 2 that we found earlier. Since b sub n is 0 for all n greater than or equal to 3, our summation simplifies significantly. We're left with only the first two states contributing to the wave function. Now let's write out the full expression for psi of x and t using just these two terms. Now that we have expressed the solution in terms of eigenstates, let's compute its squared modulus, which represents the probability density. This means we take psi of x and t and multiply it by its complex conjugate. Next, we proceed by substituting the expression we found earlier for psi of x and t into this equation. The complex conjugate only affects the exponential terms, flipping the signs of the exponents. After applying this, we arrive at the following equation. Next, we simplify the middle term. We recognize this as the definition of the cosine function, so we can replace it. Now we substitute the explicit forms of psi 1 of x and psi 2 of x. Using these expressions, we substitute them into our equation for probability density. And with that, we fully determined psi squared of x and t. This tells us how the probability density evolves over time.
In this next step, we'll calculate the expectation value of position. This is represented by the integral of the wave function, psi of x and t, multiplied by the position variable x, and then by the complex conjugate of the wave function, psi star of x and t. Mathematically, it doesn't matter where we place the x, but it turns out that for other variables, the placement of the variable of interest must be between the two wave functions. Now we substitute the square of the absolute value of the wave function. We have three integrals to solve. The first part of the integral contains the position variable multiplied by the sine squared function, which we will solve step by step. To simplify this integral, we apply a trigonometric identity that transforms the sine squared term into a cosine expression. Now we split the integral into two parts. The first part is simply the integral of x from 0 to a, which is straightforward. Let's evaluate the second integral. By the symmetry of the odd function, the integral from 0 to a of x times the cosine evaluates to 0. And that's it. The result simplifies to a squared divided by 4. We can substitute this result back into the original integral. Now the third integral is essentially the same as the one we just solved. Since the steps are identical, there's no need to go through the process again. The result of this integral is also a squared divided by four. Next, we focus on resolving the middle term. To simplify it, we apply a trigonometric identity that transforms the product of the sine functions into a combination of cosines. This allows us to break the expression into two separate integrals. Let's focus on the first integral, which we'll solve using integration by parts. Applying the integration by parts formula, we get an expression that we need to simplify further. Substituting the results of the integration by parts, we arrive at the following expression. The first term vanishes because the sine of pi times x over a at the limits, 0 and a, is 0. So after evaluating the remaining integral, the result is negative 2a squared divided by pi squared. The second integral follows the exact same steps as the previous one. Since the process is identical, we won't go through it again. In this case, the result is negative 2a squared divided by 9 pi squared. By adding the results of both integrals, we find that the final result for the middle integral is negative 8a squared divided by 9 pi squared. Now that we've solved all three integrals, we've successfully calculated the expectation value of the position x. From this result, we can see that the expectation value of x shows an oscillatory behavior. It consists of a constant term, a over 2, and a time-dependent term with a constant amplitude of 16 a over 9 pi squared, oscillating at a frequency of 3 omega with a phase shift of phi. This means that introducing a relative phase between psi 1 and psi 2 affects the motion of the expectation value, shifting its oscillations in time compared to our previous result. Now that we've calculated psi of x and t, the probability density, and the expectation value of x, let's explore two special cases, when phi is equal to pi over 2 and when phi is equal to pi. This is part of problem 2.6. First, let's set phi to pi over 2. Substituting this into our expressions, we get the following modified wave function, probability density, and expectation value of position. Notice that in the probability density, the cosine term has now transformed into a sine function, meaning the oscillations in probability density shift their phase. Similarly, in the expectation value of x, the phase shift inside the cosine function effectively introduces a time delay in its oscillations. However, the amplitude and frequency remain unchanged. This tells us that adjusting the relative phase of the wave function alters the timing of oscillations, but does not affect their overall magnitude. Now, let's set phi to pi and see what happens. With this change, the phase shift in the probability density and expectation value of x is now different. In the expectation value, we see that the cosine term has effectively shifted by pi, meaning the oscillations are now completely out of phase compared to the original case. This means that instead of reaching a maximum at a given time, the expectation value now reaches its minimum and vice versa. 
the effect is a complete inversion of the oscillatory motion, showing that the relative phase between the wave function components controls the direction of oscillation in time. So by adjusting phi, we see that we can shift or even invert the oscillations in the expectation value of x. This highlights the physical significance of the relative phase in quantum mechanics. It directly influences measurable quantities, even though the overall phase of the wave function itself does not. I hope this breakdown helped you understand the problem step by step. If you found this video useful, don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment if you have any questions or suggestions for future topics. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.